Hello again. In a previous video, we took a look at a lunar and planetary camera from QHY. In this video, we're going to look at the other side of the coin, and that is the long exposure type cameras for uh, imaging deep space objects. Now, if this is something that you've had a look at and you, you know, you've sort of considered, you'll know as well as I do that it's an absolute minefield. Uh, you know, it's, it's do I go DSLR or do I go for a dedicated CCD camera for my telescope? If I do, do I get a colour one? Do I get a black and white one? Uh, what are the filters for? Uh, what size of a, a, of a chip do I want in my, in my CCD? And it, it just goes on and on. It's such a minefield. You just really, you know, want your, your softest slippers on and keep your fingers in your ears as you're sort of going around. Um, so let me just apply my logic and, and what made me make my decision for, for what I wanted. Um, firstly, uh, DSLR or, or dedicated CCD, for me it, it was technically a no-brainer. Um, DSLR, yes, if you've already got a DSLR, um, then you know why not? And they do take absolutely astounding pictures. Uh, if you're looking for a DSLR to use for your normal photography as well, sort of a, you know, a, a family camera, then again, kill two birds with one stone. Um, but for me, I've got a, one of the sort of point and shoot um, fine pics type cameras that does fine for, for my family photos and pictures that I want to take for the website and everything. So really, I wanted a dedicated CCD. So then the next thing is, colour or black and white well for me I, I just apply logic really um, if you go for mono then the next thing that you're going to need to do is invest in the colour filters for the RGMB uh, then you've got filter wheels and you've got to take so many of, of the red and so many of the green and so many of the blue and then there's this luminescence thing and everything uh, I've got to tell you that myself I'm, 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 I'm impatient and to be honest I like to just be able to connect a camera up and take my images and then stack them and, and look at them so you know again that was sort of an easy one for me I wanted a, a one shot color camera so the next thing after that was well what size of it of, of chip do I want on my CCD and again I just sort of applied a little logic to it and that is that I've looked at a lot of images that have been taken by people with DSLRs and you've got to be honest they're not disappointing um, you know there's some absolutely stunning images taken by people with DSLRs so what I did is I thought okay let's look for a dedicated CCD camera that's got a DSLR size chip and that's what I found and that was the QHY8L um, now this really is an out of the box video because this actually arrived only about maybe three hours ago um, so you know that's what we're going to look at so let's just have a look at what you get in the box right so what do we actually get in the box with the QHY8L well we get the camera itself which from my experience, I've actually never seen one of these in the flesh before. I've only ever seen pictures in in magazines and websites, and it's actually uh, quite a bit bigger than I expected it to be. Um, I don't know, you just see these things on their own on a picture, and, and you expect it to be about the size of a, an eyepiece, um, but it's not. It's you know, it, it's quite an hefty little item. Uh, the case is aluminium, and also there's a, a venting system there goes through this is actually the heat sink for the cooling because they are electronically cooled it's a it's a cooled ccd um, on the back we've got three connectors one is the power input which is a, a multi-pin sort of plug which we'll we'll look at in a little bit more detail later then there's the normal sort of usb connection for connecting the the camera to your your pc and then there's actually a guiding port uh, socket on here so you can use this camera for guiding now I have to be honest and say I'm not going to cover the guiding aspects of this because if you're using one of these to do guiding you, you've basically got more money than sense um, on the front we've got the uh, UVIR filters already built in and another thing that surprised me when first looking at this is the size of the actual sensor um, which if you're used to looking at the sensor in webcams and everything it's absolutely huge if i put my finger at the side there you can see and it is sort of a, a 35 millimeter sized um sensor like you get in a dslr so also we get this which is known as a, a silica tube and you can see that it's got a little thread on one end with a, a hole and then at the other end it's a little 
cap with rubber seals on it like a little bung and again we're going to go into that in some detail a little later also we get the control box if you like um, this is where the 12 volt power goes in and then the connector goes from this to the camera the reason being that the camera uses several different voltages um, so this actually has got the voltage droppers in there it's also got some indicator lights on there to tell you what's going on and whether your fans going and whether your cooling's going and that your, your DC supplies okay and healthy um, what else do we get well we get a standard USB 2 lead for connecting the camera to the PC and we also get the power lead which is the as I said before it's, it's a it's a multi-pin sort of power lead and it's it's definitely plenty long enough um, you know to reach to the box which to be honest I will probably be looking at velcro in this to be mounted at some point or another we also get a tilt ring which is this now what this is for is, as you notice, it's a little bit like a, an eyepiece fitting and what you can do with that is fit it onto the front of the camera and by adjustment of the three screws it gives you a little bit of sort of tilt and sideways movement and what that's for is if your imaging train isn't quite square sort of your, you know, your focus are maybe a, a little bit out or you've got a little bit of focus a droop or something by the amount of, that you tighten these screws, you can get a little bit of movement of the camera in the imaging train, which hopefully will, will level things out. Nine times out of 10, if you've, if you've got your telescope set up properly, you're actually not gonna need this. Um, you know, just, just put it in a drawer somewhere and, and keep it safe. Uh, also on the camera, there is a quite large headed screw on the side, which again, we'll sort of look at in a moment. Uh, also, I just want to dispel a myth about the QHY8L. If you're anything like me and you're sort of, you know, considering an investment like this, you're going to do your research. And the first thing that you will probably find with regard to the QHY8L is, or the QHY8, um, you'll find that there's people on all sorts of internet forums saying, avoid the QHY8L, don't buy it, uh, it's, got an, it's got an issue. Um, and they freeze up on the on the cover on the front on the front glass uh, they've got a frosting problem uh, let me just tell you now that was an issue two years ago uh, it was sorted out two years ago it's no longer an issue hasn't been for two years uh, you know it's just a, a, a rumor really that's been carried on and carried on and carried on um, so there isn't an issue with that with with the icing and frosting up now onto the screw on the front that is actually where this comes in the silica gel tube now when you've got your camera you are going to have to buy a couple of extras and it actually won't cost you very much to be honest the first thing that you want to get is some of these now these are silica beads and it's the it's the, similar to the stuff that you get in the little sachets uh, that comes in in telescopes and various pieces of electronic kit now, I just happen to have a packaging supplier very, very close to where I live. And the reason why I've got this many is because they're actually very, very cheap. And, you know, I just sort of called them and said, this is what I want. And they just gave me a bag full. Um, you'll also want to get yourself a few of these, which are the actual silica gel bags. And like I said, we'll go into where you use these a little bit later on. Another purchase that's worthwhile is to get yourself one of these. I know it's not to keep your sandwiches in. Um, it's it's a resealable uh, lunch box, you know that you you just buy from sort of supermarket or something. But the intended purpose is obviously picnics and putting sandwiches and everything into it. And we're going to go into that one in a couple of minutes as well. So, what do we do with the silica tube? Well, the simple thing with this is that we take the lid off, and we take some cotton wool. Take a little piece of cotton wool, like so, and just push it into the tube, like that. And then just sort of use a, a matchstick or um, a cocktail stick or something just to, just to push that piece of cotton wool down there a little bit, like so. Once you've got the cotton wool in there, take your bag of silica beads. And these are actually very posh silica beads. If you can get all of these, they're actually very useful. Um, as you can see, they're orange coloured. 
Now, when they're spent or they're used up, um, you know, that sort of they have absorbed as much moisture as they can. They actually turn green. This one, these ones. And another good thing about them is that you can actually put them on a little tray in the oven and, and just put them on a very low light for a short while and they, they go back to orange again and are reusable. So what you do is you just fill your little tube with your silica beads. Now I find these silica beads are actually of a size where they won't drop through that threaded hole anyway. Um, but even so I've still put the cotton wool in there. Once you've done that, then you just put your cap back on. And that now is your, is your silica cylinder charged up, if you like. Now what you do with that is you take the large headed screw off the side of the camera. Like so. And this now replaces it. like that now why do we do that well it's simple physics actually um, and what it is that these cameras use a cooling system in them which is uh, known as a tech cooling system or sometimes known as a peltier uh, or a cold finger and what it means is that the camera is electronically cooled it's chilled down to up to about 20 degrees below ambient temperature and it's just common physics that if you've got the equivalent of a refrigerator system in, in an enclosed area, it causes condensation. And you know, as a result, some of the condensation can cause frost and you know, it's something that you want to avoid. So the idea of this is that it absorbs any moisture out from the camera itself. Now, why the lunchbox? Well, if you're outside with your scope, uh, you, even though your scope isn't sort of a chilled electronic instrument, you know from experience that your scope gets coated in dew, it gets absolutely wet through. So what you want to do with these is to take the screw out when you've finished using it or unscrew your little silica gel canister and take your sealable lunchbox like so, store your camera in your sealable lunchbox along with a couple of silica gel bags and then seal it up like so now obviously after you know certain periods of time that you, these these silica bit but uh, these silica bags are going to get spent and just you know replace them uh, but they do take absolutely ages to to get used up and it's just a really good tip that one to to prevent any of any moisture affecting your your camera and to remove any moisture that will get in there as i say it will do there's, there's no ifs or buts about it you will get moisture in these cameras um, as I say, and it'll happen with any camera that's chilled. It's just, it's just physics, really. Um, so there we go. It's just a good way to store it. In fact, if you ever do get a problem with moisture in a chilled camera, this will fix it for you. If you open up any seals that are on there, um, sometimes you get what they call a purge valve on the camera or or similar. Same thing. Just take it off, put it into a lunchbox like this with some silica gel bags. And I would say leave them for about 24 hours and it'll usually soak up any moisture that's inside in that camera. Um, now I think we've covered the hardware, it's over to have a look at the software and this is going to be a first for me as well. So what we're going to do is take a look at the software side of things. Just when you thought we were going to introduce you to the software, I'm actually going to introduce another factor. And that is, if you're getting into these sort of cameras and everything, I highly recommend you get yourself a copy of this book. It's called Making Every Photon Count, and it's by Steve Richards. And it is just an absolutely brilliant book, especially for the price of it. What it does is it takes you step by step through the imaging process, the equipment used, um, shows you some example pictures, tells you about the different types of cameras, uh, shows you some example photographs, um, deals with all sorts of things like the processing, basic processing's covered in there, uh, fields of view, just, there's just all sorts in there. There's some about guiding and about um, drift aligning and it's just a really, really good informative book and very, very highly recommended if, you, if you're sort of getting into the, the long exposure imaging side of things. 
Right, we've now got the EasyCap software launched, which is the, the software that comes with the, um, the QHY cameras. Uh, you can use your own software. You know, if you've got a preference for something else, then uh, Maxim DL is one. Nebulosity is another one. So you're not actually stuck with the, the QHY software if, if it's not your cup of tea. Um, but I do have to say, it, the overall sort of interface it looks quite simple. And the instructions for the camera, um, they, they actually just guide you through a, a preliminary capture, if you like, um, sort of a, an out-of-the-box to get you started sort of routine. Um, now, what we do is, once the software has been launched and the camera's running, in fact, you might actually be able to hear the noise of the camera. They are actually fairly noisy. Um, I want you to bear in mind also at this point that you were learning at the same speed as me because... Like I said earlier, this camera actually arrived about three hours ago and this is my first experience with this piece of software. So if I get something wrong, then, you know, it, it's just the way that it is. Um, but the, like I say, the instructions seem to be fairly straightforward to follow. So the first thing that we do is, once we've got the camera connected and we've got the EasyCap software launched, is we go to the camera menu and QHY8L, which is my camera, was already highlighted. If you find that your camera isn't highlighted, just click on scan camera and let it just scan your, your system for the cameras and then whichever model that you've got should highlight. Just click on that highlighted camera and a tick will appear beside it. Now the next thing we've got to do is to set up the cooling system in the camera. So what we do is go to camera setup and go to temp control and you're presented with this sort of little graph now at the moment I have a tech offset which means the cooling is, is switched off. Uh, I would recommend you start off with this slider here and just set it to about minus 20. Now you need to bear in mind that that isn't minus 20 degrees, that's actually uh, 20 below the ambient temperature. So at the moment I'm in a house that's maybe sort of 20 degrees, which means if I go to minus 20 it'll actually take the camera down to, to zero degrees. Once you've set that temperature, which, you know, the minus 20 is about an average and, and is where I would start off, to be honest, uh, I would then suggest clicking Auto Control. Now, when you click Auto Control, you'll see that this percentage slider will actually change and move about on its own. What it's doing is it's, uh, it's changing the voltage and the power that it applies to the cooling system so that it doesn't have actually shock anything, any, any of the system anywhere. You know, it's not applying instant cold straight away. Now also what you'll see is this blue chart, you'll see that this pointer will start to drop as it's lowering in temperature. Also you'll see here um, that it says 21.3C and it's going down 21C. As I said, I'm in a room that's about sort of 20 degrees or so, so it's actually working itself down now um, until it hits the temperature that it is that I've set. So if you're doing a normal setup, what you would do is, is set your temperature control up and leave your camera then, just wait for a little while for it to cool down. And you see that, you know, this, this temperature here has stabilized. The percentage controller will slide about on its own um, because you're in auto mode, um, which like I say auto I would recommend. And it, it's just basically it's setting itself up and, and, and controlling just how nice and gradually it drops that temperature and how much power it's using. So once we've done that, we can actually just sort of close that, that cooling section down. And next we're on to the, what we call the preview screen. Um, which you know here you've got these these little controllers that will go from one screen to another in the preview screen uh, according to the setup uh, preliminaries in the in the manual uh, it tells you what to set the gain at set an offset of one two five and then work on the exposure time and as we said this is a preview screen so you can actually shoot a preview frame to have a look if you're actually seeing anything in your scope or you can go into what we call live view which means it keeps taking the frames and you're watching each frame as it updates and as you can see i've just upped the exposure a little bit we can see a lot of hot pixels there which again the camera's quite warm it's indoors um, we've also got this this sort of flash on the right hand side which i'm actually in a lit room and i've got the cover on the camera but even so lights getting in there through the various vents and everything um, in fact i've also got the screw removed 
um, where the uh, the little tube, the desiccant tube, screws in. So it's quite possible that some light's getting in through there. In fact, if I put my thumb over it, you can see that that actually starts to disappear. So that's the culprit. Once we've got into a um, sort of an area where we've got our preview, so we're happy with it. We've we've got focus. We've got a bright star. Use the batting of mask or however you prefer to focus. Once we've gone through that sort of side of things, what we do next is we go from the preview screen and go to the capture section. And this is where we start to set up our capturing. Obviously, again, and your offset and your exposure are still all there, and you can, you know, set those to, to however you directed. The offset uh, calculation really is 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 actually a calculation that you do and again the instructions are given in the manual it's not a bad manual to be honest to say that it's it's a chinese translated manual i've seen a lot worse and you know if, if you just work your way through that manual it, like i say it, it's quite good um we've got the binning modes which again are explained i'm not going to go into sort of too much detail about the intricacies and everything number one because i've got to learn it myself but also because um as I say this is sort of an out of the box review there is going to be a part 2 where I'm going to take some images with this camera eventually when the um, sort of abundance of cloud that we've got currently in the UK clears itself up well as you can see we've got the capture and the stop and it's just like using a piece of um, webcam software really uh, you know you've got the exposure and the gain the only difference here is that you've got the offset uh, you know so it actually looks as if it's it quite simple to use which I'm, I'm very happy about so what do we think overall? So, in conclusion, what can I say about the QHYAL? Well, as I said, I haven't used it yet. Um, although you can go online and find, you know, literally hundreds of pictures that have been taken with the QHYAL and, you know, it just seems to perform well. Um, we'll have to wait and see for part two when I've actually had a go with it myself. But as regards to build quality, and um, even the quality of the manual taken into consideration, as I said, that it's it's from China, it, it's quite good. Uh, what I do like about QHY is that if you go to the QHY website, then the, the they do have an online forum there that's manned by uh, Mr Q himself, because QHY is actually the initials of the owner of the company. Um, and Mr Q's in there himself, and I have to say that it, it's just something I admire that, that you can approach the owner and, of the company and the designer and, and specifically ask questions if you are having any issues. So, so far from me, it, it's a definite plus and I'm really looking forward to using it. So that's it for this one, and once again, thanks for watching.